When someone mentions buried treasure, many, if not most of us, immediately think about swashbuckling, fast living, walking on the wild side, unscrupulous pirates. We might think of Long John Silver, and we imagine treasure maps and explorers who used them to discover fabulous riches of buried treasure. Hello and welcome everyone, wherever you may be, to the audio teaching ministry of CWR Christianity Without the Religion. Before we specifically think more of buried treasure, let's first of all pause to consider Jesus, who is of course the treasure who is known and freely available, not buried, not hidden at all, to all of us by God's grace. And he invites us as a part of our relationship in and with him to commemorate his death as oft as we do so. So that is the time frame and the repetition and the number of times that we choose to do so is in fact a choice. And by doing so, as we commemorate his death, we recognize the significance of both his death and his life, for he is risen, and he lives that we might live in him. And so today, on the first of the month, as we normally do here at CWR, we'll be coming to the table of the Lord. On behalf of Jesus, we invite you over to his house, into his dining room to a banquet table that he has set, and he serves at that banquet table, and he places his very own body, often called in religious circles, the host, he places his very own body and blood on that table for us to imbibe, all symbolic, of course, that we might become, in a very spiritually real sense, one in him. So if you wish to join us literally, that is using the symbolic elements that we use, you're going to need a small piece of bread and a small amount of red liquid. Now I say joining us literally because if you choose to join us and you cannot do so literally, you're still going to be joining us because all we're doing here is enacting a ceremony. And like any ceremony, it's rich with symbolism, but the elements and the symbols themselves are not the reality. The ground of all spiritual reality is Jesus, and his reality is not reserved for those who undertake certain ceremonies or rituals or certain elements within those ceremonies and rituals. So if you're scurrying around, if you're busy, if you're in a place that's inconvenient for you at this particular time, for instance, driving your car or riding your bicycle or in a gym doing your exercises or whatever it may be, and you really don't have time, and it might be even unsafe as you're driving your car to juggle a small piece of uh, bread or biscuit or cracker and red liquid, you are just as welcome at this table. And this ceremony and service will be just as meaningful for you without these physical elements. Tables, which we're at right now, in a spiritual reality. We're at a table. Tables are places where people become more intimately acquainted. Tables are places where people renew and build relationships. The act of sharing a physical meal is at the very heart and core of what we enact here in what we call the communion. Other people call it a mass. Other people call it a Eucharist, other people call it Lord's Supper. This table of the Lord is his table. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, that God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm. So just picture yourself seated at this banquet table with Jesus and with so many others stretching as far as the eye can see. This is a table given to us by God's grace. Our seat is reserved because God has made the reservations and he's paid the bill. 
nothing about this bill is something we can earn or that we can deserve or that we can pay for. It's all by God's grace. The bread before us is the symbol of the body of Jesus, both his physical body given for us on his cross and his universal spiritual body, the body of Christ, in which you and I are members by his grace. Now, you may or may not be a member of a denomination or a congregation, but that membership is really immaterial to what we're talking about here. You may be a member of a church. I am not. But I am a member of the church, and you are as well. The church is what we celebrate here, the universal body of Jesus, which has no denominational barriers or boundaries. It is the only church that owns me. And so it is that church and that body that we partake of, that we imbibe of, and eat of him by his grace. So please, if you are joining us, as I said before, literally, with this piece of bread or cracker or cookie or whatever you have before you, take that in your hands with me now. Let us raise this small physical symbol to our lips. And together with brothers and sisters around this world who are also members of the universal body of Christ, let us receive him, our Lord and Savior, the body of Christ. And now in a similar way, uh, if you have the liquid before you, the red liquid, whatever container it may be in, it may be in a teaspoon or a tablespoon or some measuring uh, device, a glass or a cup. This red liquid, raise this to your lips with me. Gaze upon it, for as we look at it, we think of the new covenant in the blood of the unblemished Lamb of God, who through his sacrifice redeemed and purchased us as God's own dear children. Let us now together receive this liquid as a symbol of the new covenant, the blood of our Lord and Savior, the cup of Jesus Christ. Let us now pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, it is a priceless privilege and treasure to be a part of of the body of Christ by your grace. The banquet of communion with spiritual brothers and sisters, most of us unknown to us, we've never met them, unknown to us in this electronic ministry for many uh, who now hear my voice, I've not met, nor have they met me, unseen by us, but known and seen by you, is a rich and wonderful blessing. What a blessing it is to be given all that we will ever need because of your love, because of your goodness, by your grace. Thank you. Now we pray your continued blessing as we ponder a short one-verse parable of Jesus in which he compares the kingdom of heaven to buried treasure. Illuminate and inspire us. This we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 is our keynote passage today in our message titled, The Treasure of Grace. The Treasure of Grace from Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Two sentences, 35 total words. That's it. This 35-word parable contained within two sentences is one of seven kingdom parables in the 13th chapter of Matthew. The seven kingdom parables in this chapter all begin with the same formula the formulaic phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then following that formula, that introduction, which is the same for all seven, Jesus gives a specific parable. 
the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about in chapter 13 of the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, is not about our eternal home where we will exist eternally with God. Now it is, but not primarily, perhaps I should say that. The kingdom of heaven described by these seven parables, and specifically by the two sentences and 35 words of the parable we're studying in our keynote passage, is about a spiritual reality, a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual dynamic where Jesus is Lord, and that kingdom is everywhere at once. It isn't just a future kingdom. It is now. It exists wherever Jesus is Lord. That hopefully is in your heart and in your soul. That hopefully is within friends of yours that you may even right now be sitting gathered together, sitting at a table, and joining us as we have this service. The kingdom of heaven is the risen life of Jesus that we accept and embrace, surrendering our own desires and goals, so that Jesus, who is Lord, may live in our hearts, minds, and souls. And when that happens, we've got the kingdom of heaven going on. The kingdom of heaven is thus within us when we embrace, believe, and trust in Jesus, who is the king of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm going to suggest two possible interpretations of this parable of the treasure in the field. In my mind, both of these interpretations are valid because both are Christ-centered, and in fact, they're almost like two sides of one coin. When all is said and done, they're really not that different. See what you think. Here's the first interpretation of the parable we've just read, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. The first interpretation is this. The treasure of which the parable is speaking is Jesus. The treasure is the kingdom of heaven. And they're both the same thing, of course, because Jesus is the king of the kingdom. He is the kingdom of heaven. So the treasure is Jesus. The treasure is the kingdom of heaven. That's the first interpretation. Let's talk about that a little bit. If indeed that would be a correct way to look at and understand this parable. Some say this parable about treasure in a field in verse 44 of chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew and the equally brief one that follows about the pearl in verse 45, are all about the value of the kingdom, because the value, we've got a treasure, and we've got a pearl of great price. And so they say, well, it's about Jesus telling us about the value of the kingdom. Compared with everything else, it is the most valuable thing, possession, you may ever have. According to this interpretation, the exact identity of the man who finds the treasure here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, is not that important as is the main lesson of the parable. The man, indeed, according to this interpretation, might be you or me. The man or woman who finds the treasure is not someone upon whom Jesus lavishes praise for all their good works. Morality or immorality of the person who finds the treasure is not the focus of this parable. Who the man was, how big he was, what his race was, or indeed, if he's even a he, the gender, is immaterial to the story. According to this first interpretation, or perhaps we might say this first Christ-centered perspective, God is depicted as giving his grace to whomever he wishes. This parable does not depict God as rewarding someone who works really, really, really hard and then deserves God's grace. This parable says that God gives his grace when and where and how he wishes. So Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, and the grace of God, according to this interpretation, is the treasure in the field. Now, you might even go on and say that the person who finds this treasure is not particularly, at least by the details given, a law-keeping, obedient to all the rules kind of a person. In fact, if you really take a look at this uh, brief 35-word parable, you'll think, well, you know, 
wow, this person was in somebody else's field. When he discovered the treasure, what was he doing there? Now, maybe that detail is immaterial, again, to the parable, but what does he do, this person, when he finds the treasure? Does he beat a path up the field to the farmhouse and say, hey, Farmer John, I was just walking through your field, and I saw something, and I did a little digging, and for some reason, I found an incredible treasure I thought you should know, because obviously, this belongs to you, and so you should enjoy and profit from the treasure that was hidden in your backyard all these years. Well, though little is said in this parable of 35 words, it seems that Farmer John, who actually owns the field, had no idea about the treasure in his backyard in the South 40. But the person who finds the treasure doesn't tell Farmer John. In fact, he hides it again so it can't be found. Then the man who found the treasure, the person, goes home, sells all of his possessions, and when he has enough money, he goes down to a real estate agent's office, and he tells the agent to go buy the field for him because it's got this treasure in it, and he wants the treasure, not necessarily the field. We might even say that this man appears to be buying the field under false pretenses without disclosing that the field contains a treasure because if Farmer John really knew that his field had a treasure, he'd never sell. Now, here's something to keep in mind when reading any of Jesus' parables. Parables are not morality tales. Parables are not like the Hans Christian Andersen stories that commend all the actions of the hero or heroine and reward that person for his or her actions. Given this first perspective or interpretation of this parable of the buried treasure, we might say it's a lesson for all of us, for truly all humanity, regardless of whether they're considered virtuous or corrupt, is searching for something, searching for meaning, searching for spiritual treasure that is buried. We are so lost as humanity. As we stumble through life, we often are walking all over somebody else's territory. In fact, very little of the territory that we walk over or sit in or sleep in or work on or traverse is our own. And so we might say that we all are trespassing most of the time over someone else's field. Perhaps we might say in today's culture that if it's almost like that we're pushing a shopping cart down the street and we're spiritually homeless, hoping to find the prize which will mean that we can stop using that shopping cart that might not even belong to us because the shopping cart's in the hands of homeless people, 99.9% .9 of the time, I think I'm correct in saying so, I doubt whether very few of them pay the grocery store for that uh, shopping cart that they're pushing. Here's another thing to keep in mind about this parable. Jesus is not giving this parable to teach us that he commends dishonesty. He doesn't approve or praise someone finding something of value that belongs to somebody else, then hiding it, and then profiting from buying it from them under circumstances which are dishonest at best. Perhaps this parable is most of all about you or me or anyone finding grace. And I think that's the sense of this parable, is that we just stumble on it, and it might even be on somebody else's property. There's no mention in this parable that this man or person is devoting their life to searching for treasure. We just stumble on it. Nothing about this person having bought a map from a sailor down at the port who sold him a treasure map. He's not maybe even overtly looking for treasure. Treasure just happens. And that's really what happens by God's grace to us. The timing and circumstances are of God's choosing. So this is grace in spite of how this person had lived or was living their life. This is the treasure of God's grace in spite of religion and membership in religion, in spite of the color of one's skin, in spite of gender or sexuality. Now, secondly, Let's consider a second possible interpretation of this parable, as time is fleeting as it always does. The treasure is you and me. That's the flip side of the first one, where the treasure was the kingdom of heaven, the treasure was Jesus, the treasure was God's grace. Now we'll think about the treasure as being you and me. Consider this perspective. There is a man, and there is a field. The man finds a treasure hidden in the field, then he buries it again, and then he goes and gives all he has and buys the field. 
If we assume we're the person finding the treasure, then we must consider also the fact that Jesus says, this person has the resources to go and sell whatever they have, a lot of resources, so that they can buy the field that contains the treasure. But the very idea that you and I can purchase a spiritual treasure with our own spiritual resources is anathema to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're told so many times in the New Testament that the kingdom of God can never be purchased or earned by human merit. It's only given as a gift by God's grace. So we must consider the idea of humanly finding the kingdom of heaven as being inconsistent with the gospel of Jesus, and the perspective that is more consistent with the gospel is that Jesus finds us. So perhaps the field that Jesus is talking about, indeed, that would be consistent with other parables here in Matthew 13, where the field is the world at large. Maybe that's what we're talking about. And Jesus is the man who is looking for buried treasure, and who is it? What is it? You and me. Now, what does he want to do with us? I mean, because we're not exactly a great find, <laughs> but, but he thinks we're a great find, and he wants to further enhance us with the treasures of his grace. So he hides us. Now, how does he hide us? Well, maybe Jesus is saying in this parable that the riches of the kingdom of heaven, and this is an interesting perspective if we follow this interpretation, that the treasures of the kingdom of heaven are hiding in plain sight, in the sense that, as Paul says in the first chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians, the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. That is, those who do not accept and receive the spiritual vision that God gives regard the kingdom of heaven as worthless. Those who dismiss the grace of God as foolish and idiotic remain spiritually blind and are unable to see the treasure of God's grace, which is right there in front of them, right under their nose. So there you have two perspectives of how we might interpret this parable from a Christ-centered perspective, and I think both have validity. What do you think? There are two sides of the same coin, as I see it. First, that is, the treasure is Jesus, the kingdom of heaven, the gift of God's grace, and second, the treasure is you and me, because we become co-heirs of the kingdom of heaven, because we're found by Jesus, and because the grace of God is freely given to us. Give it some thought. Study and pray more about this parable, and for that matter, all six other parables of the kingdom of heaven given here in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, what a treasure Jesus is, what a treasure your riches are, and apparently we, by your grace, are a treasure to you. And that's truly staggering. Thank you for that. Thank you for your blessings, for your goodness, and your grace. And we pray for people around this world in need, both spiritually and physically, and we do so in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank all of you for being with us today. Join us next week, and our message at that time will be titled, God Loves and Likes You, based on Philippians chapter 1, verse 8. May the God who gives you endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please join us on our website, www.ptm.org, for more spiritual nourishment that we provide through the many ministries and resources here at Plain Truth Ministries.